So listen to this, if I asked you in your opinion is the most clutch player of all time, I'm guessing most of you would say Ronaldo, Drogba, Aguero, you know, one of those big names, but the thing is, those guys score a ton of goals seemingly every game. What I find truly mind-blowing are players who are seemingly average, struggle all year round, but somehow show up every time their teams are in need. And so, according to that definition, I'd say the most clutch player of all time is Divock Origi. Look, this guy wasn't another level when it comes to all of that. If it weren't for those clutch goals, everyone would see him as a nobody, just some C-tier striker who scammed his way to the top, but in reality, his timing was so impeccable with the few goals he scored that he managed to cement a legacy as one of the most beloved players of all time. Looking back at his goal scoring record, it's hilarious. It's like the guy had some mental block and could only score when his team was losing. He was so clutch, it didn't even make sense. Though, to be fair, I got a strong point to make about that. People always clown on him saying, how does this bench warmer keep scoring so many iconic goals, where does he get his powers from? And the answer to that is simple. Divo Corrigi was never meant to be a bench warmer. People tend to forget, or at least they tend to ignore the fact that when he was a teenager, he was seen as a literal prodigy, a wonder kid, whatever you want to call it. From the beginning, it was already obvious that Origi was destined to be a footballer. The whole reason he was even born in Belgium was that his father was a professional footballer playing for Genk. In fact, it was a pretty big deal. He played for the Kenyan national team and he was even one of the key players in Genk's first ever league title. And before you ask, yes, I did check his goal scoring record because obviously I began wondering if his father was as clutch as him and well, he really was. The year Genk won their first ever league title, 50% of the goals he scored were either match winners or goals that tied the match and without those goals Genk would have easily finished second. So yeah, it clearly runs in the family, after all his uncle and his cousins were also football players. But uh, moving on, as you might imagine with his father playing there, Origi spent most of his younger years in Genk's academy and to start it all went slow and steady, but by the time he turned 15 his talent became so undeniable that several Several clubs began approaching him, some say even Man United came into the mix, but in the end Origi ended up joining Lille instead simply because at the time his fellow countryman Eden Hazard was at the club and he just couldn't resist following his footsteps. And yeah, for a while it all looked great, Origi kept progressing and progressing, by the time he was 17 he was beginning to play his first few matches with Lille's B team, then he got called up to the Belgian under-19 national team and before he knew it, Lille was giving him his professional debut. Now, look. I'll let you guess what happened in that first match for Lille. The coach called his name in the 68th minute with the team losing 1-0, Origi came in, paced around for a bit and then scored to level the game and grab a point for his team. It was the first clutch goal of his career and it came just 6 minutes into his debut. It was just meant to be, and it was so impressive that by the end of the season he had already made 10 appearances becoming Rudy Garcia's most frequently used sub, which meant that the next year he had already been permanently moved up to the first team and again on the first match of that season Origi scored the winning goal. In fact, by the end of the season he had scored 6 goals, the third most in the team and definitely the most by someone who was not a regular starter and it was all made that much more impressive when he took into account that again, most of those goals were oddly clutch. And trust me, that did not go unnoticed because not only did Origi begin getting call-ups to the national team here and there, but once Benteke was forced to forfeit his place in the World Cup due to injury, 18-year-old Origi was called up in his place against all the odds. And yeah, sure, it's not like anyone was legitimately expecting an 18 year old to have a massive impact in a World Cup, but he actually did. On his first match he came in with Belgium losing 1-0 to Algeria and though he wasn't involved in the first goal, it was only thanks to his great off the ball movement dragging two defenders that Mertens had the space to score the winning goal. But yeah, I get it, that's not a direct contribution, but in the second match, with Belgium tied at 0-0 against Russia, Origi came in late and smacked in the winner, celebrating his entire Maracana kneeled at his feet. He had just become the first Kenyan to score in the World Cup, the youngest goal scorer in the entire tournament and Belgium's youngest ever goal scorer at a World Cup. And still, 
things weren't over. The following match once again with Belgium tied nil-nil with South Korea, Origi came in and eventually pulled off a great shot from outside the box, allowing Vertonghen to score on the rebound. After these performances, he even earned two consecutive starts once the knockout stage began, but ironically, that only led to his most unremarkable performances of the tournament. Though, to be fair, they didn't stop him from winning the award for the most promising sportsman of the year in Belgium, and even more importantly, they didn't stop Liverpool, who had supposedly been monitoring him since he was 15, from finally signing him for a fee of 13 million euros. Though, to be fair, they would loan him back to Lille for one more season before he joined them for good, and though that year showed us some incredibly clutch moments, at one point even scoring a hat-trick in a 3-0 win, which reminded me of someone else, it was still probably the worst year of his career so far, at one point going on a six-month long drought that landed him in the Keep's worst team of the year. Regardless, with all the contracts already signed, it's not like Liverpool could back out. However, once he arrived, it was clear that in reality, Brendan Rodgers, who had even told the press that Origi was world-class, had no intention to play him, with the strikers struggling for months until the arrival of Jurgen Klopp. It was almost funny how quickly things changed for Origi the moment Klopp arrived. If with Rodgers he had only been afforded four appearances, with Klopp he began getting more and more time and only a month and a half later he was already scoring a hat-trick against Southampton. Two matches after that he came in late and decided he had another match and even though then he began getting hit with one minor injury after the other, losing space in the team to the likes of Coutinho and Sturridge, the supporters had grown more and more fond of him and began pleading for his reintroduction in the team, allowing him to come back for good and go on a run of six goal contributions in seven matches in April, including one goal in each Europa League quarterfinal match against Dortmund, starting their comeback as they were behind 3-1. At the time, it really seemed like Origi would sooner or later turn out to be a serious world-class striker. It seemed like the beginning stages of a beautiful tale, but instead, the following match, Origi was given a start in the Merseyside derby and 54 minutes in, Argentinian defender Funes Mori hit him with a violent tackle that changed his career forever. Origi would stay in the sidelines all the way till the last match of the season, the Europa League final against Sevilla, where of course, Liverpool found themselves trailing behind leading Klopp to bring on Origi expecting him to pull off a miracle even if he wasn't fully fit, but in that state, it simply wasn't possible. And if there was any doubt that he was being rushed back to the pitch only because they were desperate for a goal, well, the next season, four months went by before he began getting regular playing time again, he clearly wasn't anywhere near full fitness back then. Still, you gotta give it to him. Once he came back, he was in seemingly some of the greatest form of his career, scoring in five consecutive matches, only to lose his spot once again as Sturridge, Coutinho and Firmino simply took over as the team's main attacking trio. In fact, if this trio already starved him of chances, the next season would get even worse with the arrival of Mohamed Salah, so Reggie simply decided to ask for a loan, afraid that the lack of game time would kill any chance he had of getting a call up to the World Cup, which eventually landed him at Wolfsburg. Once there, playing alongside Mario Gomez, there were a lot of expectations, and at first, he was living up to them. Three matches into his time there, he scored a clutch goal, three matches after that, he scored another, and I'm not even kidding, three matches after that one, he did it again. But unfortunately, that would pretty much be the end of it, with Origi once again going into a major slump in form, scoring only once in over five months, which greatly affected Wolfsburg, sending them straight into the relegation zone. At this point, Origi's mental state couldn't be the best. Any chance he had at a call-up to the World Cup was gone, his team was about to get relegated, and throughout all of this, he was being forced to watch from afar as his old teammates led Liverpool to the Champions League final. However, with Wolfsburg being forced to play for their lives in the Bundesliga playoffs, it was of no surprise to anyone that Origi's clutch gene kicked in, leading him to score an assist on the decisive match, keeping Wolfsburg in the top tier and attracting some interest in the Premier League, with Wolves offering Liverpool 22 million for his signing, only for Origi to reject every approach and insist that against everyone's advice, he was going back to Liverpool, hoping to earn a place in a team that at the time had maybe the greatest attacking trio in the world, Mane, Firmino and Salah. It seemed like a foolish decision, he wasn't gonna take anyone's spot and even if he did, it's not like he was gonna be able to outdo last season's incredible run to the Champions League final. Or was he? Well, as the season started, Origi was clearly a massive question mark for Klopp. He clearly didn't really want him there anymore, but he couldn't deny how clutch the guy could be at times, so the season was 
complicated. By May, Origi had only been allowed more than 15 minutes of game time in a handful of matches and even when he did play, strangely, he was now barely ever scoring. Though, to be fair, it was easy to point out something. Liverpool were in some of the greatest form in the history of the Premier League. 44 matches without a defeat, so unfortunately for Origi, it's not like there was anything to be clutch about. Except that then, as Liverpool were one step away from another Champions League final, Barcelona humiliated them 3-0. Liverpool were completely lost, they needed a four-goal win in the second leg, no team in history had ever managed such a feat, and not only was Firmino now injured and out for the second leg, but Mané had been completely nullified in the first leg, not even registering a single shot on target, and Salah, maybe the only one to truly cause an impact at one point hitting the post, was now out after suffering a concussion only days before the second leg. The perfect storm was brewing, an historic humiliation seemed more likely than a comeback, but then, well, in the last match day before the final, with Liverpool needing a win to keep the title race alive, Origi came in late and scored to stop Man City from becoming champions of England, and in that moment, a little light bulb lit up above Jurgen Klopp's head. What if he started Origi in the second leg versus Barcelona? Just how clutch was this man truly? Could he pull off a real-life miracle? After all, he had already played six Champions League matches that season and he hadn't even managed to pull off a single shot. Why would he be any more likely to break through Barcelona's defense than Firmino or Salah? Well, no one really knows the answer to that question, but that day he did start and seven minutes in he had already scored with what was his first shot throughout the whole competition. And guess what he did with the second. After 50 minutes that saw Wijnaldum pull off two more goals to tie the match on aggregate, a corner was taken quickly and Origi scored yet again to perform the greatest Champions League comeback in 15 years. Even Lionel Messi had been left in complete disbelief, covering his face with his hands, defeated by the GOAT. Divok Origi. This was already enough to cement Origi as a cult hero for the rest of his life, but instead of conforming, he pushed even further, showing up a month later as Liverpool were holding on to a one-goal lead since the first minute of the Champions League final, coming in and scoring with three minutes to go to secure the title. It was only his third shot since the start of the competition, meaning he had just become the first player in history to finish a Champions League campaign with a perfect conversion rate of 100%. And that wasn't even all there was to it. He was also only the second ever Belgian to score in a Champions League final and only the fourth to ever win the tournament. And alongside that, these were some of the most memorable footballing moments of the late 2010s and so the entire world fell in love with Origi, the most unlikeliest of heroes the internet's favorite meme and maybe for a moment there, the most adored player in the world. Seeing all of this, Roma, Sevilla and Leverkusen came forward, but even if a year before Klopp was more than willing to part ways with a striker, now he was the one to insist his contract be renewed. But what is not talked about enough either is that from this moment on, Origi pretty much disappeared. Even his clutch moments came in short supply, something went wrong. As the following season started, it almost seemed like Klopp was desperate to force Origi onto the team, using him like a dirty mop, even though there was barely any payback. Though to be fair, Liverpool's ridiculously pristine form could be blamed for it, as Origi did come clutch in the one match of the season where such a thing was needed, scoring twice against Arsenal in a 10-goal blockbuster, including an injury-time match decider. But honestly, that might have been his last memorable moment ever since. With Origi's only goal of the next season coming against third-tier Lincoln City, Liverpool put him on the the market for a mere 15 million pounds now that Diogo Jota had also come into the mix, but shockingly, not a single club in Europe was willing to pay that much for him. In his final season at the club, he managed to impress one last time with five goals and two assists over the mere 394 minutes he got until December, but once again, an injury put a stop to all of that, further reassuring Klopp that it was time to part ways with a striker. By the end, even though Klopp claimed that Origi was a legend, that people would write books about him, even though Robertson told the press that one day he would visit Origi's statue with his grandkids, even though a massive farewell was set up for him, even though the fans claimed that football without Origi is not Nothing. One thing was sure. No one bothered enough to convince him to stay, and ever since leaving to AC Milan, things have only gotten worse. Over his 36 matches there, he has only scored twice, even getting booed by the public on several occasions, as the Gazeta dello Sport would claim, Origi arrived with a reputation for scoring important goals, but so far, he has only scored the useless ones. And though I'm sure that five minor injuries in a season didn't help, I gotta ask you. 
Is this the end for the Vogue Origie?